Okay, so then I start. Um, good afternoon. Well, we already saw each other this morning, but anyway. So, okay, today I will essentially have the last lecture about rings, maybe not completely finished, but almost. And so we start out talking about uh, Euclidean rings and principal ideal domains, uh, some short remarks on this. Principal ideal domains. So last time we had um, seen the division with rest for polynomials uh, with coefficients in a field, and everybody knows the division with rest for integers. So a Euclidean ring will be a, a, an integral domain where you have division with rest. So. Domain uh, with uh, division with rest. So if we have an element A and B in this ring R, then we can write uh, A has QB plus the rest R. And in a suitable sense, the rest should be smaller than b, than the thing we divide by. No? Like with, uh, if you divide uh, uh, a number by another, the rest is smaller than the number you divide by. And so we have to find a way to measure this, and this is done by a certain function from r to z bigger than equal to 0. So let me define it. So an integral domain. Uh, R is called Euclidean ring if we have the following. So if there's a function which is what measures how big the rest is, D from R without zero to, say, the negative integers, uh, such that the first thing is that we can write, whenever I'm given elements a, b, and r, one can make division of a by b with rest. So I can write, there ex so then there exists an element q in r such that a is equal to QB plus R, and R should be, as I said, smaller than B in a suitable sense, so that either R is equal to zero or D of R, D of small r, is smaller than D of B. Second condition, which is somehow less important, says that this D is compatible with the multiplication. So the second condition is that uh, so if for if B is an element in R which is not zero, um, and uh, A is an element in R, so. Maybe like this, then uh, we have that D of AB is bigger than D of A uh, yeah, for all A in R without zero. This is the same statement, but with a different. So 
whenever you um, so whenever you multiply uh, this d gets bigger so if that's uh, the thing which measures how big our uh, element in r is somehow the elements get bigger whenever i multiply by a non zero element what Yeah, this must be true because this would otherwise be obviously wrong. <laughs> it's not a unit. Thank you. Because obviously otherwise, if you know, for instance, if b is equal to 1, then uh, this can never be fulfilled, as you can see. Yeah, I copied it wrong. Anyway, it clearly has to be that. So um, we have easy examples. So for instance, if we take z and we take d of a number n is, for instance, equal to the absolute value of n, this is a Euclidean ring. And uh, up to the, con you know, the convention of how you define you want the sign of the rest, this gives you the usual division with rest. And uh, <clears throat> also, uh, we had seen that if um, k is a field, and so then kx with uh, d of a polynomial f is equal to the degree of f, is a Euclidean ring. So this was essentially what we did the last time. You now, when we um, we had the division with rest was precisely so that the degree of the rest is smaller than the degree of what we divide by, and it's uh, in the second condition is also obvious because uh, a polynomial is a unit if and only if its degree is zero. And the degree of the product is the sum of the degrees. Then I want uh, at least one other that we do not know. We look at uh, Z of E. So this are the set of all uh, E, so N plus M I complex numbers such that n and m are integers. So these are just, uh, if you look at the complex plane, these are just the uh, points which have coordinates integers. <coughs> so this is uh, obviously a subring of the complex numbers. i is the usual i, square root of minus 1. Um, <coughs> then, um, and so we want to say that these are called the Gaussian integers. And I claim it's a Euclidean ring. With, um, well, if I take D of N plus I. Which one do I want it? I am equal to n squared plus m squared. Um, so we have to see why this is the case. Well, so this, you know, for complex numbers, this is just the restriction to the Gaussian integers of the square of the complex absolute value of the complex number. So, so we, can, we can extend D to the whole of C by, you know, obviously D of A plus IB, where A and B are real numbers, is equal to A squared plus B squared, which uh, would be the square of the complex absolute value. Hmm? 
as you have uh, no doubt learned in the complex analysis. So in particular, we have that uh, D of A plus IB is different from zero if A plus IB is not the zero in the complex numbers. And it is well known and easy to check um, for, say, Z and W in C, we have that D of Z times W is equal to D of Z times D of W. Now you can immediately check this anyway from the formula if you remember the product of complex numbers, and um, which you hopefully do. Um, and um, so we have this. You can easily check this. So now we want to make our division with the rest. So, so let say now Z and W be elements in Z of I. So this is, you know, whatever N1 plus M1 I, N2 plus M2 I, anyway, it doesn't matter. So we take two elements. So we can certainly, we want to divide Z by W with rest. So we first just divide it in the complex numbers. So let Z divided by W, which uh, I write as A plus BI, be the quotient in C. So obviously W is different from zero. So what does it, and we then just want to find uh, as the kind of quotient in uh, in ZI, something which lies close enough to this. So we choose, say, uh, NM in uh, Z such that, um, say, a minus n, so the absolute value of this difference is smaller or equal to one half, and the absolute value of b minus m is smaller or equal to one half. Oh, we can certainly do that. Just shows the nearest one, the nearest integer in the corresponding direction. And we put q, put q equal to n plus i m. So we have our element in Z of i, and this is supposed to be the quotient. So we can first compute this different difference between, if I take Z minus W, minus M plus I N. What is it? Well, according to the definition, this is A minus N squared plus b minus m squared n, yes. And so this is one half squared one quarter, one quarter. This is smaller or equal to a one minus half. What? A minus. No, no, I mean, I, I think I, in, the, in the notes maybe we have the other notation, but I think this is consistent with itself. Um, Okay, so we have this, <clears throat> and so we can, so we put the rest uh, as Z minus uh, N plus, ah, here I, have, I did it wrong, no? N plus I M. Uh, 
times w. So this is supposed to be the rest. So let's see where that works. Uh, so this is the rest. So, so we can write, now we can write z, obviously, is equal to, we just put on the other way out, uh, n plus i m w plus r. So this is our division with rest. And uh, what we have to see that d of r is smaller than d of w. So d of r is equal, well, <coughs> we can, so if you just multiply this here, it's just this divided by this. So this is uh, d of z divided by w minus n plus i m times d of w, because uh, this is just this, r is just this multiplied by w. And um, we know that this is, this thing is actually one half, so this is certainly smaller than d of w. And we know that this is smaller equal to one half. Okay, and so we find this. And uh, <coughs> the second statement is, is obvious, so we, we find that this is a, indeed a Euclidean ring. Okay. So um, now I wanted to so one of the things that Euclidean rings are is principal ideal domains. So that means every ideal is principal. So that means every ideal is generated by just one element. Um, and so in particular, the, for instance, every ideal in Z is just the multiples of one integer. So definition. A ring, yeah, so I think I want an integral domain R is called a, a principal ideal domain and as this is a bit long one usually always just writes PID. Um, if uh, every ideal I in R is a principle. So that means, by definition, as we have already seen, that uh, I is equal to A for some which is the same as A times R. Uh, for some A in I. Okay. So, and the, the remark here is, I mean, I call it a theorem, although it's not really that every Euclidean ring is a principal ideal domain. Well, it's actually quite simple. So we just have to use this division with rest to do it. So let's take a principal ideal domain, a, a, a Euclidean ring. And we chose ourselves an idea. So now we want to see that this ideal is principal. So 
So if i is just the zero ideal, then it is obviously principal because then i is equal to the ideal generated by zero. So that's principal. So thus we can assume assume that i is different from the zero ideal and uh, um, uh, let a be an element in i which is different from zero. But we choose a particular one. We choose, we have this wonderful uh, d. We choose an element which has the minimal d. d of a minimal for all A in I, whatever. So we choose an element in I for which this D of A is the smallest possible one. We want to claim that this generates the idea. Well, so <clears throat> so let um, B be an element in I. We have to show that B is a multiple of A. So we can do division with rest. So then B is equal to Q A plus R with Q in R, and the small r uh, is equal to zero, in which case we are done, because b is, uh, we have found that b lies in, uh, or uh, uh, d of b, d of r, is smaller than d of a. But we know, you know, but if you look at it, but by this equation, we have r is equal to uh, b minus qa. These are two elements of i, so this is an element in i. And uh, under this assumption, it would be non-zero. This, so this d of r, smaller dna d than d of a, is a contradiction to the choice of a. So this is a contradiction to the choice of a, because d of a was supposed to be the smallest d of something for any element in i, which is different from 0. So it follows r is equal to 0. So that means any element b in a is a multiple any element b and i is a multiple of a. So that's b in a. If I take an element b and i, it's an element in i. So i is equal to a. OK. So in particular, we find that uh, these uh, Euclidean rings that we have just introduced are PIDs. So, in particular, we have that Z, Z of I, and K of X for K field are principal ideal domains. I don't know whether it has an apostrophe or not. OK. <clears throat> so we can also talk about principle, uh, about great and com greatest common divisors in principle ideal domains. So I, I had defined prin uh, greatest common divisors in, uh, uh, in integral domains. And uh, I said it's not always clear they exist. I only 
give a definition, but it doesn't mean they have to exist. But in principle, ideal domains, they do exist and are actually quite simple. So this is a proposition. So let R be a PID. And uh, let uh, uh, take some elements, A1 to AR, some elements in R. Then there is a, a greatest common divisor of A1 to AR exists. So maybe I call it D. Exists and is of the form of the form can write it as a linear combination of these, d equal to a1, x1 plus ar, xr with x1 to xr, is r elements in r. And actually quite, I mean, uh, it's the obvious thing. These a1 to ar generate an ideal. This ideal is a principal ideal. It will be generated by one element, which I call d. And this element D will be the greatest common divisor, or one candidate for the greatest common divisor. So, so proof. So we choose an element D in R such that if I take the idea A1 to AR generated by these, so all linear combinations of these, that this is equal to the ideal generated by D. By um, our, I mean, we know that this is, a, every ideal is a principal ideal, so also this one, so we can write like this. And the claim D, so the claim is obviously that claim D is a greatest common divisor. This is basically obvious. Just look, check the definitions. So by definition, we have obviously that each AI lies in the ideal generated by D for all I. And but what does it mean? That it lies in the ideal generated by D means precisely that it's divisible by D. Whatever. Okay, that's just what it means to lie in the ideal. And so it is a common divisor. So thus, D is a common divisor. of uh, A1 to AR. And to be the greatest common divisor, it has to be, it has to uh, be that every other common divisor divides it. So let E and R be a common divisor. So satisfy E divides AI for all I from 1 to R. Then I have to see that E divides D. But uh, if it divides all of this, then E, divide, if D E divides AI, it divides, say, XI times AI. No? And um, if it's divides all xi times ai, it divides the sum of all of them. So E divides A1 x1 plus A R x R. Because it divides all the ai and therefore the sum which is after all D. And so that's fine. So it's the greatest common divisor.
So for instance, in Z, we have that um, if we take the ideal generated by 4 and 6, this is the same as the ideal generated by 2. And 2 is the greatest common divisor of 4 and 6. OK. So, <clears throat> so that was a rather simple uh, remarks about this is all. I'm wondering whether I missed something. No, it was all. So now I want to start to talk about irreducibility uh, of polynomials. Um, we will later, you know, we'll talk about field extensions. So you have a field and you want to construct a bigger field which contains the original field. And you do this somehow by looking at, uh, uh, you know, with the help of an irreducible polynomial. And so we want to have a, a way to construct them and to check that polynomials are irreducible. So first I talk about irreducibility in general. So definition. So this I'm talking about irreducibility. Well, T of polynomials. And so first I define what irreducibility means in general. So definition. Let's say R be an integral domain. So an, an element uh, A and R would be called uh, irreducible if it cannot be written in a non-trivial way as a product of two other elements. So non-trivial, so the trivial way would always be that you write it as a product of something with a unit. So therefore, uh, an element, say, Q in R, of which I assume it's not zero, is called irreducible. Well, so maybe first, if Q is not a unit, because that would be a bit too stupid. And um, if Q is equal to A times B with AB elements in R, then either A or B is a unit. Obviously, we can always uh, multiply with the inverse of a unit in order to get such a decomposition. So that would be too stupid. So <clears throat> for instance, um, say, so maybe first I finish. So it's, it is called reducible if it's not irreducible. So. So, uh, so if uh, Q is again is not a unit and not irreducible, it is called deducible. So this means, in other words, you know, if one wants, doesn't want to say it in such a direct way, it obviously just in indirect way, it obviously just means that uh, so Q is reducible if there exists A and B in R, which are not units, none of so without 
units uh, such that Q is equal to A times B. So, for instance, in, in Z, we find that uh, the prime numbers are irreducible. And uh, in fact, you can easily check that all the irreducible elements in Z are plus minus P, where P is a prime number. So I want to give you a few more. So, okay, so I can even write it again, example. So an element Q in Z is irreducible if and only if Q is equal to plus minus P, where P is a prime number. That's almost by definition. Then if you have a field, if K is a field, it has no irreducible elements. Because after all, all elements in K without zero are units, and so no, and zero also was excluded, so there's uh, no chance. And um, <clears throat> then let's look. Uh, so again in Kx. So we have that. Uh, I claim that. Uh, so a x plus b is polynomials with. Uh, a, an element in K which is not zero, and B, so K is always a field, no? and B, an element in K, is irreducible. Well, this thing is not a unit, it is not zero, so uh, it is irreducible if uh, it cannot be written as a product of two elements which are not units. Um, and so if AX plus B is equal to F times G for F and G polynomials, then we know that the, in the product, the degree is additive. So the degree of uh, AX plus B is equal to the degree of F plus the degree of G. Now, the degree of AX plus B is evidently 1. So, and the degree is at least 0. So, uh, 1 is the sum of two non-negative numbers. So, at least one of the numbers must be 0. So thus, the degree of F is equal to 0, or the degree of G is equal to 0. And now, as this is <coughs> a non-zero element, it follows that F and G are not 0. So it means you know, a constant polynomial is a unit in Kx. The constant polynomials, the non-zero constant polynomials, are units. So it means that. Either F is a unit or G is a unit. Namely, when it's degree is zero or G is a unit. And so this means precisely that this thing is irreducible. So I come back for one moment to this PID. Then we use this for the polynomials. So if you have a principal ideal domain and you have an irreducible element, then the ideal generated by it is a maximal ideal 
And therefore, if you divide by this, maximum, by this ideal, you get a field. So, no, here, proposition. So let A be a PID, principal ideal domain, and P in A, an irreducible element. Then the ideal generated by P is a maximal ideal in R. And we know that being a maximal ideal is equivalent to the quotient uh, by this idea being a field. So the last second part is obvious, and R mod P is a field. So this is just uh, to remind you of it, the statement is this one. Okay, again, this is uh, quite simple, but we will later use it. So almost by definition. So let's see. So let's do the proof. So we take our irreducible element. And uh, so we want to show that the ideal, so let I in R be an ideal with, uh, say, P contained in I. So this contains means uh, not necessarily strictly, it's contained in I. So this ideal is a principal ideal. So we can write I equal to A. So that P is contained in the ideal generated by A means that P itself is contained in A. So that uh, I can write uh, P is equal to A times B for some B in R. So now there are two, po two possibilities. Either this element B is a unit or it's not. So either B is a unit we have seen that if I have a unit, then an ideal generated by one element and the ideal generated by the same element multiplied by unit gives you the same ideal. So if P is a unit, then P is equal to A. No? Because if I just multiply you know, this A by unit, it gives you the same idea. Um, so that's one possibility, or B is not a unit. Ah, but I, this was actually not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah, yeah, but I'm kind of, uh, I uh, so I think I want to, <clears throat> let's try again. So, well, maybe you can repeat what you said. Um, 
Ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Obviously, I have to use my <laughs> I have to use my assumption somewhere. No, <laughs> I have assumed that p is a prime element. Obviously, I'm not trying to prove that uh, this is true for any element, but I, the assumption was that it's true if I have a, an irreducible element. You know? So yeah, obviously I have to use my assumption. So, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, so P is a <clears throat> prime element. I have written it as a product of two things. So if either B is a unit or A is a unit, because P is a prime element, or B is not a unit, then A is a unit. Yeah, sometimes. But you know, then because P is prime, is you know ir irreducible. So then, obviously, if if A is a unit, the ideal generated by a unit is the whole of the ring. And so we have seen that if our prime, if our uh, irreducible element is contained in an ideal, then either that ideal is equal to the ideal generated by P, or it's the whole of the ring. So that's precisely the definition of a maximal ideal. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so we want to use this uh, to construct new fields from olds by uh, use of uh, polynomials. So basically, if we are given an irreducible polynomial, we get in this way a field. So corollary. Let K be a field. And F, the polynomial in Kx, uh, an irreducible polynomial. Uh, then uh, we know that, um, after all, uh, the ideal generated by F is a maximal ideal, and so then Kx modulo the ideal generated by F is a field. And um, I can view it uh, as a field containing K as a subfield, so which contains, strictly speaking, um, a field isomorphic to what I just say K as a subring. Oh. So <clears throat> I will identify so because the if I so by what we said before, if F is an irreducible polynomial, then Kx modulo f is a field, and um, because uh, this is a maximal ideal in Kx, and uh, so the so we have the the constant polynomials um, so the if I take the map from the constant polynomials to this quotient, this is an isomorphism onto the image. So the map, uh, um, so, so on, so, <clears throat> so for, uh, say, A in K, we have the class of A, no, so the map, the restriction of Kx f to k, which are the constant polynomials. Uh, 
is an isomorphism onto the image. So we know that this, uh, so restriction of kx pi So we have the canonical map to the quotient. If I restrict it to k, then the map is injective. Because the, um, it would have to be <coughs> either, so as k is a field, and I restrict the map to k, it would either have to be the zero map, which is obviously isn't, because the uh, constant polynomial, because k does not in lie in the idea generated by f for an irreducible polynomial. And so uh, it is, uh, an injective, this map from K to the image here is an injective uh, homomorphism of fields. And so f therefore it is, a, you know, so it's an isomorphism onto its image, which is a, a subfield of this. And so later we will be concerned with the question, we are given a field and we want to study larger fields which contain this given field. And here we have kind of found a way to always construct such. So if we are given ourselves an irreducible polynomial in our field, then we get a larger field which contains the field where we started. And um, <coughs> for instance, we will see later that we might want to find a field in which uh, a polynomial has a zero. And we will find that uh, somehow surprisingly in this field, this polynomial f will have a zero. So uh, somehow in a, anyway, but this we'll look at later. So we come back to this later. Now, um, as we um, have now uh, found this, uh, so we, this somehow is one of the reasons why we're interested in irreducible polynomials, because they allow us to make fields. So bigger fields from smaller ones. Um, and so now it would be useful to find some criterion for a polynomial to be irreducible. And so we will uh, do this only uh, for the case that k is equal to q. But we also have to do it then at the same time for k equal to z because that is what uh, makes it work. So we want to study the irreducibility over Q and Z. So we have polynomials in QX and in ZX. And we want to uh, find out about the irreducibility by comparing what happens in Q and Z. And the first result uh, about this is due to Gauss. So we have first the lemma and then, so first of we have a lemma, which is the first step towards this. Ah, so we uh, first need definition. So obviously for the, <coughs> for polynomials in Z, uh, if you take an irreducible polynomial in Z and you multiply it by a, by a number, by an integer, which is not a unit, it will not be irreducible anymore. No? So because you can, after all, divide it by this number, and this number was not a unit. So therefore, we want to first look at uh, polynomials which are primitive, which means that their uh, coefficients have no common divisor. So definition. The polynomial. Um, f say equal to sum i equal zero to n a i z x to the i is called primitive. If the greatest common divisor, so this is a polynomial in z of x, 
so the AI are integers. So if the greatest common divisor of the AI is one, or so, so if uh, the A0 to AN are relatively prime. prime, which by definition just means that a greatest common divisor of the coefficients is 1. So we don't have any common factors for the coefficients. In that case, it's called primitive. And um, the first uh, lemma of Gauss is actually quite simple. It says that if you have two primitive polynomials, then their product is also primitive. It seems kind of obvious, but uh, maybe it isn't. So let f and g be two polynomials with coefficients in z, which are primitive. Uh, then f times g is also primitive. So, well, we just try to see whether we can have a, we assume it's not primitive, and then we will quite easily bring this to a contradiction. Let's see. Assume f times g is not primitive. Uh, Ah, well, I can first, but I need to introduce some notation. So, so maybe we write f equal to sum i equals what I want, 0 to n a i x to the i, g equals sum I equal 0 to m, whatever, um, bi, x to the i. And um, so we assume that fg is not primitive. Um, so um, so then if it's not primitive, then the, um, the uh, all the coefficients of fg have a common divisor. Uh, so there's a, a, non, a, a number which is not plus minus 1, which uh, divides all the coefficients. And so we can take this number to be a prime number. There's a prime number which divides all the coefficients and of f times g. No? If there's some number which divides all the coefficients and this number is not a unit, then I take... Uh, a prime number which divides this number, which divides all the coefficients, and this will divide all the coefficients. So then there is a prime number P, which divides all coefficients. of f times g. But on the other hand, it does not divide all coefficients of, it does not divide all the ai, and it does not divide all the bi. p, ai, and not all. So, so therefore, we can take the smallest i for which it does not divide it. So let i be minimal such that p does not divide a i. And let j be minimal such that p does not divide b j. So take the smallest such 
index for which it does not divide it. I, don't, I know it doesn't divide all, so there will be some it doesn't. I can, can take the smallest one. So, so if I call, maybe I call C of I plus J the coefficient of um, X to the I plus J in F times G. So what can I say about it? You know, by the formula for the product, we can express it in terms of the AI and the BJ. So you have that CI plus J is equal to AI times BJ plus the sum over all K, which are bigger than I, AK B I plus J minus K, and plus the sum over all K, which are smaller than I, AK B I plus J minus K. No? So just, obviously, this is just the sum over all A L B M, such that L plus M is equal to I plus J by definition. And so it's, I can do it in this. But now, if I look at this, <coughs> here, when K is bigger than I, then this number here, I plus J minus K, is smaller than J. So this index is smaller than J. So that means P divides B I plus J minus K. So it divides every sum and here. When k is smaller than i, then k, oh, obviously k is smaller than i, and therefore p divides a k. So we find that p divides this whole sum. p divides both sums. But it does not divide AI, and it does not divide BJ. So it does not, as it's a prime number, it does not divide AI times BJ. It does not divide AI times BJ. So therefore, it does not divide this one. And, you know, so this uh, contradicts our assumption no, that, uh, that f times g was not primitive, and therefore we could choose such a prime number. So this is a contradiction. And so we find that indeed f times g is primitive. So this is uh, then mostly used to prove a theorem, which is also called Gauss lemma. So it's a lemma for the Gauss lemma. which says that um, if I have a, pol a primitive polynomial with coefficients in Z, then it's irreducible in Zx if and only if it is irreducible in Qx. So if I can write it as a product of two polynomials in Zx, I can also write it as a polynomial of two polynomials in Qx and vice versa. Okay, and so let's see. So let f in kx be a non-constant no, in zx. Be a non-constant primitive polynomial. Then f is irreducible in Zx if and only if f is irreducible in Qx. So if I cannot write it in a non-trivial way as a product of polynomials with integer 
coefficients. I also cannot write it in a non-trivial way as a product of polynomials with rational coefficients. And that doesn't seem to be so obvious. So there, uh, I mean, it's equivalent. So there are two directions. First, we do the easy direction. Um, so so if f is reducible in zx, so it's by contraposition in zx, uh, then you can write f is equal to g times h, where g and h are both non-units in zx. No. Yes. So if the degree of G is equal to zero, that means G is constant, then uh, it means that G is a non-unit in Z, and, and we have that uh, this number G is a common factor of all coefficients of uh, F equal to G times H, because after all G times H is just obtained by multiplying all the coefficients of h with this number uh, g. And uh, so f is not primitive. So it follows it's bigger than 0. And the same, same argument applies if the degree of h is equal to 0. Now it's a symmetric. So uh, thus we also have the degree of h is bigger than 0. So we have written f as a product of two polynomials of positive degree. So it means it is, uh, this also describes it, this polynomial as being reducible in qx. So we have uh, f. of h bigger than 0, that means f is reducible in qx, because this is a way of writing it as a product of two units, two non-units in qx. Now, if I have a polynomial, okay, so this was the easy direction, because, you know, we just have to take the same, now we have to use the, go in the other way. So this is the more surprising part. You have to see that if you cannot write it as a product of two polynomials with z coefficient, you cannot write it as, as such a product with r coefficients. What? Uh, G and H are obviously polynomial What? G and H are polynomial integers. Uh, they are non-crystal polynomial integers, so they are polynomial integers. 
Does that make yeah, sense? yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, no, I've finished. I mean, this is the argument. I've, but what is the? Uh, F is a reducible in Q. Yeah. So it must be reducible in J. Because the X is in Q. Mm. Well, that's what I proved here, no? This is the direction I. Proved. Um, no, no, no. But the, the the units are different. No. So if you cannot. So. Ah, let me see whether your argument makes sense. Um, well. I mean, in some sense, but you know, you have to realize that there are, you know, in Zx there are a priori more uh, irreducible elements. If you have a non, if you have a constant in Zx, which is a, a, an integer, which is not plus or minus one, then this is irreducible. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so. Is a yeah. Well, no, you need a tiny argument. You have to use that your polynomial is primitive, because otherwise it's actually false. If you take the polynomial 2x, for instance, if you take the polynomial 2x, this polynomial is irreducible in qx, but not, you know, but not in, in zx, because it's 2 times x. And these are both non-units. So I mean, the argument here is very simple, but uh, you, know, you just have to see that they have no common factor. You know, if you assume it's primitive, it's, you know, I also haven't given very much of an argument here. The argument is precisely more or less what you say, but you, you have to just exclude the possibility that they have a common factor. So, but uh, you know, obviously you are right that this is, this is supposed to be the trivial direction and it is almost as trivial as you say, but uh, anyway. So now let's go to the other one. So again, we do by contraposition. So, so suppose that f is equal to gh, where g and h are now polynomials in qx. And we assume these are polynomials of positive degree. So then we have to, see, so it means the polynomial would be reducible in Qx. We have to see that it's also reducible in Zx. So, so we have this. So now we can, so, so these are, so G has some coefficients. So some Ai x to the i. There are some rational numbers, so we can multiply with, a, with some integer, so to clear all the denominators. So we multiply with all the denominators of, of the coefficients here. We multiply with all the denominators here, and we um, divide by the greatest common de denominator. So I, let me say it like this. So clear the denominators of... Uh, uh, the coefficients of f and g and divide by the greatest common divisor of the new coefficients. So then we will get that f is equal to somehow uh, a divided by b, g prime, h prime, where uh, you know, g prime is uh, uh, g multiplied by some 
rational number so that it is so that with, with G, G prime and H prime primitive uh, in Zx. So I mean just, uh, you know, as an example, whatever, if you have, uh, if, my, if F is equal to 7, fifth uh, plus uh, uh, 3 divided by 8, so x plus this, then you would uh, multiply here by 5. So the, in this case, you would get, uh, you have to multiply by, by 40, and you would get that uh, you can instead just take uh, f prime, so this was maybe g, would take uh, g prime to be 7x plus 3. So it's a polynomial which is the same up to multiplying by a, no. <laughs> Hopefully you do not believe that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, 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 seven times, uh, so this is 56x plus uh, 15. I think that's more likely to be true. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, obviously should not be caught forgetting what one learned in before one went to high school. Anyway. <coughs> okay. So anyway, I just replace this by this multiplied by, by some rational number, this by this multiplied by some rational number, so that these two are two primitive polynomials. And, uh, you know, the product is like this. So maybe just write again. So we have G prime is equal to, uh, to um, alpha times g and h prime is equal to beta times h with uh, alpha and beta are some rational numbers. Now that's how it works and then you can do it in such a way that they're primitive. And uh, so <coughs> now um, now, let's look at it. And I can also assume, obviously, here we have a rational number, so I can uh, kind of clear the common factors so that we have A and B are relatively prime. No? And are relatively prime. No, you can just uh, put it like this. So, uh, in particular, we can also write, write this uh, by a very complicated uh, uh, transformation. We can write this as bf is equal to a times g prime h prime. So, <clears throat> but now what do we see? You know, both f and g prime h prime are primitive. Now f is primitive because we have assumed it to be primitive, and g prime and h prime were both primitive, and by the lemma we had before, the product is primitive. That's why we proved that lemma. So if we look at this equation, we see here a greatest common divisor of these, of all the coefficients is one. So a greatest common divisor of all the coefficients in this product is b. Of coefficients of um, pf is b, and the great and the greatest common divisor of the coefficients of uh, uh, a g prime h prime is a. But how is it possible this is the same polynomial? So the same polynomial, the same coefficients have as greatest common divisor b and a. So we know that greatest common divisors are uniquely determined up to multiplying by a unit. The units in z are only plus and minus 1. So it follows that b is equal to a or 
B is equal to minus A. So in other words, F is equal to G prime H prime or F is equal to minus G prime H prime. In any case, we have found a factorization of F as a product of polynomials with integer coefficients. not irreducible. Okay, so this was this statement. Um, oh, it is reducible in ZX. Okay, so we want to now make a few criteria for irreducibility of polynomials. So one of the things is we usually will be interested in the irreducibility of polynomials with coefficients in Q, but we do it by checking it uh, for course uh, over Z. So the first uh, result is um, the Eisenstein criterion. So, so theorem. Eisenstein, so some German mathematician, criterion for irreducibility. So it's uh, something which one can sometimes apply to show that the polynomial with coefficients in Z is irreducible over Z and therefore over Q. So let F be a polynomial, so sum i equals 0 to say n, a i x to the i, be a primitive polynomial in Zx. And we assume, so of positive degree, okay, well, whatever. Otherwise, it's too stupid. So it's not constant. Uh, and now we assume some strange condition. Assume there's a prime number which divides almost all the coefficients except for the leading one. So with um, P divides A0, P, maybe I just say, divides A1, and so on, P divides A n minus 1. But we have that P does not divide A Z A n, it does not divide the leading coefficient of degree n, and the square of P does not divide A0. So some strange condition about this divisibility, uh, then F is irreducible. First in Z of X, and therefore in Q of X. We know that these are equivalent. Okay. So this is the well-known criterion to check that the polynomial is irreducible. It's a bit special, so one cannot apply it all that often, but sometimes one can. So let's see. So we assume, again, that it is uh, reducible, and then we want to find the contradiction proof. Assume f is equal to g times h, with g and h some integer polynomials. And we have to show that either f or g is constant.
So let's write down not f or g, g or h. Okay. So let's write down the coefficients of g of h and h. So write g. So sum i from 0 to what we want. K uh, b i x to the i and h sum i from 0 to say l c i x to the i. So we have fixed the coefficients and we assume in each case that this really is the degree. So b of k is different from 0 and c l is different from 0. So we know that the constant coefficient a0 is divisible by p, but not by p squared. So as uh, p divides a0, but p squared does not divide a0, we know that, um, <coughs> and we have that a0 is equal to c0, p0, c0, we must have that p can only must divide one of these two, but it cannot divide both, because if it would divide both, then the square would divide it. So we have that. Um, so and this, we have that p divides precisely one. of um, B0 and C0. So thus we can assume, um, obviously the role of, you know, which we call G and H is up to us. So we can assume that the one, uh, uh, so we can assume that P divides B0 and P does not divide. C0. So uh, let's see. Now uh, we want to, we look instead at the highest coefficient. So An is not divisible by uh, by p, and obviously, if uh, the degree we have uh, that we have a n, so obviously we have n is equal to k plus l, and uh, a n um, again by the product formula is a k times uh, b k, is it k times c l, and we know that p does not divide a n. So thus, p does not divide b k. So we know p divides b0, but it does not divide b k. So there must be kind of a last one which it divides. So thus, there exists uh, a maximal element j between 1 and uh, k, such that p divides bi for all i smaller than j, and p does not divide Oh. So we can find the, the first one, which is which it, it does not divide. Now, we want to compute the coefficient aj. So aj is again by this formula for the product. 
this is equal to Bj C0 plus Bj minus 1 C1 plus, plus B0 Cj. So if, uh, you know, if the number L is smaller than, than J, we can add some zeros. The, the, the later Cj's we put equal to 0. So it's this. So, and now it's the usual thing. Um, so by definition, so by our choice, we have that, uh, you know, we know that P does not divide C0, and P does not divide BJ. So P does not divide BJ C0, but it divides all the smaller BIs. So it divides each sum and tier. Well, the conclusion is that P does not divide AJ. But now we have to remember what our assumptions here were. The assumption was that P was supposed to divide all of the AJs except for the, except for the last one. So it follows that this number J must be equal to N. Okay. But what does it mean? It means, you know, J is, the, is a non-zero coefficient of the polynomial, uh, uh, of the polynomial uh, G. So it means that the polynomial G has degree N, the same as F. So thus J is equal to N, and therefore also k is equal to n. That means the degree of g is equal to n, and the degree of h must be equal to 0. So we have found, we have actually shown that h is constant. Actually, we was not a and so uh, this shows that um, our polynomial was indeed irreducible. So now I have gone a bit over time. So maybe I stop here. I can just, so you can, for instance, if you just take any polynomial, x to the 5 plus uh, 16x plus 4, this would be irreducible by this criterion. And obviously, if you wanted to check directly that it cannot be written as a product of polynomials of lower degree, that would be uh, difficult. That actually is, now you should have contradicted me, no? Maybe I put two here, rather. <laughs> I was assuming that four is a prime, which is a kind of rather rash assumption. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>